Bylings for inviting us along and for everybody for, to being here with us. And I'm going to hand straight to Pete, who's going to begin. Thank you, Helen. So, um, yes, thank you again to the FSC from, from me as well. And it's amazing, you know, nearly 200 people on this. So that's uh, thank you all for taking your time. Um, so I'm Pete Brown. I'm from Anglia Ruskin University uh, and Helen is from CEH. And um, together we lead the UK Ladybird Survey. So that's, that's kind of what we try and keep up to date with in our, mostly in our spare time. Um, and what we're going to do today is give you an introduction to identifying ladybird larvae. Um, we'll focus on just some of the ladybird species. Uh, let me just move on a slide, please. So Helen's going to move the slides through for us. Um, we've got roughly, well, well over 40 species of ladybird in the UK. Um, 26 of them are kind of fairly big, colourful species. Uh, but even of those, some of them are a bit more obscure than others. So we're focusing today on really the 12 or so most common ladybird species that you're likely to see in gardens and parks and, and other places where you might be. Um, and we'll look at those in two parts. So I'm going to do a few of the species and then Helen will take over. We'll then look briefly at um, a couple of pupae. Uh, and a few words on those. And we'll say a little bit bit at the end about how to submit records and find out more about ladybird recording and uh, different resources that you might use for that. And then as Holly mentioned, we'll have, uh, hopefully it should be a good time for a question and answer session at the end if you, if you have any questions. But I'm gonna start first of all by speaking in general about the ladybird life cycle. So next one, please. So some insects, as many of you will, will probably know, have a, a complete metamorphosis. So if you think of the life cycle of a, a butterfly or a beetle, including ladybirds, um, there's a complete metamorphosis. So basically the life stages all look very different. The larvae, uh, which is the second picture on the slide here, looks very different from the adult beetle. That's not true of all insects. So um, some have just a partial uh, metamorphosis. So with those ones, the, the juveniles tend to be called nymphs. And uh, the, the juvenile ones look rather like the adults, like mini versions of the adults. So things like shield bugs and other true bugs, uh, grasshoppers and crickets, and various other groups have that other system. So la ladybirds though have this complete uh, cycle. So you, say you can think of it as a very similar system to that of a butterfly or moth. And you can see on the slide here we have an egg. Now these pictures aren't all precisely to scale, but these eggs are maybe a couple of, couple of millimetres tall, something like that. Then a larval stage, then a pupal stage, that's the third picture. So that's like the cocoon uh, or the pupa of the beetle. And then out of that emerges the, the adult ladybird. So we're focusing on the, the larvae today. The larvae themselves have four different stages in ladybirds. So we call these instars, four instars. So as they, they shed their skin as they're growing, and they do that several times through these four different stages before then um, going to the uh, pupil stage. Okay, thanks, Helen. And if we want to put this life cycle in the, in the, in the context of a year, uh, we can use this, this figure. Now, this is very generalised. This is kind of based on the seven spot ladybird, but the principle applies to all ladybirds, more or less. But the timings might be a little bit different. And those timings are also different depending on where you are in the UK. Some of you, no doubt, are in, in, the, in the far north, where things happen a little bit later than, than further south where we are. Um, and also depending on the weather in any given year. So this year we've had a lot of nice early warm weather in the spring at times. So we had records of larvae quite early this year. Um, but we thought it was a really good time to do this presentation now because now is really the peak time for ladybird larvae. And you can perhaps see that on the uh, life cycle through the year image here. Let me just take, take you back a couple of months. What we've got is the ladybirds coming out of their hibernation or overwintering 
in around about March. One or two species come out maybe even in February. Um, and then they're active and looking for mates and feeding and breeding through the spring and into the early summer. Then perhaps you can see on the figure, it's probably not that clear, but there's a little sort of cluster of eggs. And then at the bottom, there's a picture of a small larva and then a large larva around about June time. So the, the, the larval stages all together through these four different instars lasts roughly about um, three or four weeks. Um, and say June is the real key time for seeing lots of larvae around. Then the pupae, and you, again at the moment you're seeing lots of pupae perhaps, and then the new adults come through in the summer, through into late summer. They're active for a while, for two or three months, before then shutting down again for the winter. So you can see a sort of dormant looking ladybird in October on this picture. Uh, and they're then dormant as adults throughout the winter until the following spring. So if, if they're lucky, ladybirds can live for about a year. Um, mostly they, they wouldn't last that long. Um, and some species have more than one set of eggs and larvae in a year. So more than one generation in a year, um, or rather this year's new ones can themselves breed. So in other words, you can have two or three generations in, in a few of the species and therefore the, the life cycle is much faster. So that's the principle of that. And if we move on to the next one. So here are some ladybird eggs and really the point to mention in with this picture is that ladybird eggs are almost impossible to identify to species level is what, what we think anyway. Um, so we can normally tell that they're ladybird eggs but not much more than that. The colour might vary a little bit, they might be a bit more orangey than this, but they're generally this sort of shape. And unlike um, moth eggs, which can be quite, have sort of distinctive patterns in some cases, ladybird eggs tend to all look pretty similar, fairly smooth, like just these little yellow rugby ball shaped things, often in clusters on leaves, uh, or on, in this case, it's on a, a pine needle. So you can see how, how tiny these are in relation to that pine needle. Okay, if we move on. So the main subject of this talk is ladybird larvae and this is just a generalized picture of a larva just to make a couple of points before we look at specific uh, species. So you can see the different bits of it here. The head is at the top and looks quite small on here with the sort of fierce looking mandibles. Um, the head's often not that obvious and maybe a bit tucked under. And then you've got three segments of the thorax. At the, at the front and that's those are the segments that the legs are attached to and then the abdomen is made up of nine different segments. So the thing to remember here is a couple of things to look for when you're trying to identify perhaps one larva from another and I think the most useful two things are looking for the the position of kind of pale or coloured markings on the abdomen and sometimes on the thorax so which segments those coloured markings are on. And also how spiky the larva is or how hairy it is. So you can see on this picture, this looks like quite a spiky ladybird larva. Other species are much smoother than this or perhaps they're hairy. Um, so those are kind of two things to look out for. Okay, thanks Helen. So let's actually look at some of the species. Um, on each of the slides with these ladybird species. We've got a little map. This is taken from the uh, ladybird field guide and these are uh, modelled on the UK ladybird survey data. So the green areas show the known distribution of uh, the species. And to be fair, most of the ones we're talking about here are pretty much very widespread across most of the British Isles and uh, Ireland. Um, we haven't got quite such good data for Ireland, so that might be a bit patchier, but it gives a, a fair idea. Anyway, this is the seven spot uh, ladybird larva. And the pictures we're showing you are late ones. So these are the big ones, like really four thin star ones. And these are the easiest ones to identify. So the really tiny ones in the first and second instars are often less well marked they're very small, they're hard to spot in the first place, and they're quite, 
quite tricky to identify. Wow. Anyway, the seven spot ladybird larva, the thing to look for on this one is four pairs of these orange or yellowy spots on the, uh, on the larva on the side. So on the first and fourth segments of the abdomen, you've got these orange markings. It's the same on the other side that you can't quite see so well. So these basically four pairs of markings, and that's really quite distinctive of the seven spot uh, larva. The other thing is it's not all that spiky. It's got little hairs that you can see. These lumpy bits are sort of technically called um, tubercles, these sort of warty structures on the, on the segments, and a few little hairs there, but not anything too spiky. Okay, so we can contrast that with the next one. And this is the Harlequin ladybird larva. And you can see on this that it's much, much spikier. This is another big ladybird species, very widespread, not so common in Scotland. And it's got these big spikes, which are kind of branched at the top. And it's got distinctive colored markings as well. So there's uh, an orange L-shaped marking down each side, and then also four little orange uh, tubercles towards the, uh, the middle to end of the abdomen. So much spikier than the seven spot ladybird and a bit more orange on it. So next one, please. Now ladybird larvae are quite cannibalistic. Um, and I don't just mean, I mean that in a kind of loose term. So they, they feed on their own species. So smaller larvae of their own species, but also they'll feed on other ladybirds where, where they can. And harlequin ladybirds are particularly good at doing that. Other ladybirds do it too. And it's mostly a question of who's the biggest, who's got the best physical defenses and perhaps chemical defenses. Uh, and then you can find out who, who, who's gonna be the winner. Um, the eyed ladybird is our largest native species. And this is one that can defend itself very well against harlequin ladybirds, for example. And in fact, these larvae can themselves feed on harlequin larvae. You can see it's got these big spikes, again, a bit like the harlequin. And if anything, it's slightly larger than the harlequin. So the adults of, of this species, you can see a picture of the adult in the corner. And they've got these lovely cream rings around the dark spots. Um, it, they're about eight to nine millimetres long. So that's big for a ladybird and very well defended uh, larvae. So really spiky, really big, and um, some yellowy or orangey markings on the first and second segments that you can see there. And quite a prominent kind of pale patch often on the first uh, segment of the thorax. Perhaps you could point to that, Helen, actually. That's it. So that little pale patch there is often um, quite obvious on the eyed ladybird. This is a species that, although it's common, it's, it's less likely to be in, in gardens. It's a, it's a pine woodland uh, specialist, but you'll get it on pine trees in gardens as well, sometimes on other trees too. Okay, next one please. Now we're moving into slightly trickier territory with a couple of quite common species, but ones where the larvae look quite similar. And in fact, sometimes we can't really tell them apart very reliably. So the two spot ladybird, which the adults perhaps are a, 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 a more, one of the more well-known species. This is one that we're concerned about in terms of negative effects of the harlequin ladybird on, on the two spot. It's a much smaller species than the harlequin and the larvae are a lot smaller. And you can see they're not very spiky at all, quite smooth. And the things to look for on the larva are the um, two little orange segments on the first segment of the abdomen. And then in the middle of the fourth segment, perhaps Helen, you could point to that, we've got these other two little um, orange markings so in, the, in the middle there. Also, they look a little bit pale down the, the sides uh, usually. So that's a two spot larva. Now, we'll look at a very closely related species on the next slide. And this is the 10 spot. Although these pictures do look quite different, in fact, these larvae can look really similar and sometimes you can't easily tell them apart at all. They're the same genus, 
So they're very closely related species. They're similar sizes. They're often found in similar places. So of course, that's another thing to look for when you're considering what uh, larva you might have. You can consider the habitat that you're finding it in and you might be able to narrow it down a little bit from that. So the 10 spot ladybird has got these pale markings in the same places as the two spot uh, ladybird. It tends to be a bit paler. The legs tend to be pale. So that's perhaps one other thing that's, that's useful to look at. It's not uh, a guarantee, but the leg color can be a bit of a clue. 10 spot larvae would tend to have pale legs, so sort of red or brownish, whereas two spot ladybirds would tend to have uh, black uh, legs. Uh, and that's the same for the adults as well. So those two are, are pretty tricky. And let's move to the next one. So the last two that I'm going to deal with before then um, switching to Helen is the 14 spot ladybird and the cream spot ladybird. And these are another two that can look pretty similar. So the markings are in very similar places with these two species. So you can see on the 14 spot, now, by the way, if you just look at the map for a second, uh, these ones don't occur so much in, in much of Scotland, um, but, you know, very widespread over most of uh, England and, and Wales and Ireland. Um, on the second and third segments of the thorax, you've got these very pale, obvious markings, and that's, that's normally the case. And then you've got two bands, sort of yellowish looking bands, more or less going all the way around on the first segment of the abdomen and the fourth segment. So those are a couple of useful things to look for there. And again, quite pale uh, markings down, down each side. This is a, a, a speedy little larva. It, it can run quite fast. It tends to look quite leggy, quite long legged, and it's very smooth. So you can see it's perhaps not got very good um, physical defenses looks quite smooth. If we can compare that to the next one, this is the cream spot larva. Now the markings are actually very similar in terms of where the pale markings are, but this one is much, much spikier. So you can see these big um, pointed spikes uh, coming up on, on all the, uh, the segments. So that's the cream spot larva. There are sorts of habitat differences as well. So the cream spot ladybird would tend to be found on deciduous trees. The 14 spot larva would tend to be found on a kind of lower vegetation, nettles, you know, other herbaceous vegetation, but often is also found on trees as well. So there's certainly an overlap uh, here. And you can see the adults look very different. The cream spot is this lovely uh, brown ladybird with, with uh, pale spots, whereas the 14 spot is a yellow and black species, but the larvae do look pretty similar. Okay, so I'll pause there, but we will just have, just to keep you on your toes, we're going to have a quick poll. And as Holly said, don't worry, we're not going to see whether you've individually, whether you've answered it correctly or not. So the question is, which species is shown in the picture? Is it a 10 spot, a two spot ladybird, a seven spot or a harlequin ladybird? And hopefully you're seeing a chance to Click something on a poll if you'd like to take part. So we'll give a little bit of time. I'm not sure if you can see each other's responses. I can see what people are putting, but perhaps you guys can't see that. I don't think anyone can until I share them at the end, perhaps. That's good because that influences people's choices. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we've got 116 of both. Oh, no, it's 120. It's going up. Brilliant. So that means at least 120 people are still awake. That's good. To know. <laughs> um, hopefully, I know before a couple of people have had issues if they're on mobile phones being able to see the polls. I think there's an option down the bottom somewhere we can click on it and it should then appear. Um, hopefully. Just Brilliant. Perhaps we just leave it going for a few more seconds and then, yeah, it looks like most people have, have done it now. It's still slowly going up. We've got 142 yeah. responses. Okay. Okay, I'll leave it until one minute 30. Oh. Okay, I'll end this now and then hopefully everyone should be able to see. Okay. 
So it looks like most of you thought it was a seven spot lava. Uh, it's about 69% of you. Not very many people thought it was a harlequin, so that's good. So the, the, the thing there is the spikiness. It's not, um, it's, not, it's not really spiky enough to be a, a harlequin. And I can see why some of you would have said 10 spot or two spot. Um, the seven spot is fairly similar in some ways. It's, those ones are all fairly smooth. So the thing with the seven spot is these four pairs of, of uh, pale markings that you can see in the picture. Whereas the two spot and the 10 spot have uh, the front ones are sort of a bit similar, but the ones further back are in the middle rather than on the edges. If you saw them side by side, also the seven spot would generally be larger than the other two. But of course, there's quite a lot of variability there. Right, so I'll, I will um, pass over to Helen now, who's going to do the other half of the talk. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much, Pete. And Pete will be back for questions as well. Um, later on, but well done in answering the poll. I think that does prompt me to say that larvae are quite tricky. So it's, you know, I think we all learn together. And I was just saying before we came online how I revise the larvae every year because we only really have quite a short time over which we see these larval um, species. That's not true for the harlequin. We see the harlequin a lot going on all through um, the summer and others at certain times as well. But we do see them for a lot less time than we see the adults. So yeah, some revision around them is really helpful every year. So I'll move the slides forward. So the first um, ladybird that I'm going to discuss is the 22 spot ladybird. And both Pete and I think this is the one where the adult and the larva, in terms of colour pattern, there's a dis yeah, they're quite similar to one another, yellow and um, these black spots. And what's really important to notice with the 22 spot ladybird here, and this will become relevant in a moment when I go to the orange ladybird, is its black head. It has this really um, dark head and that's a really important feature um, to have a look at. But also just notice it is really bright yellow with these um, black spots. And um, if you take a look in some detail here, you can see that this part is yellow, but I mean, that's quite a specific detail to, to look at um, amidst all of these little black spots with a very fast and scurrying um, ladybird. But the, lady, the 22 spot ladybird is a mildew um, feeding ladybird. and can commonly be found on um, grasses and the sort of herb layers. So here we have the orange ladybird and it can look very similar in its larval stage to the 22 spot um, ladybird larva but you can see this really pale head and I think what else is really noticeable is that in a way the yellow is sort of forming these streaks these lines running down through um, the body and so that's quite distinctive as well from that 22 spot um, ladybird larva but they are very very similar but just take a look at the the difference between the the heads of these two species so i think the 16 spot ladybird larva is is very beautiful but i also think it's incredibly understated i mean it is just a pale brown larva um, the um, tubercles are slightly darker those little patches those little pads from which the the bristles are emerging and you can see that the bristles are uh, the hairs are a dark color um, there isn't really much more to say about the 16 spot ladybird larva than that it is a little pale brown um, ladybird larva and you can commonly find it if you were to um, look through grasses um, or be sweeping through grasses um, you would find it um, it's it's a very pretty little ladybird larva so I'm sure we shouldn't have favourites, but the 24 spot ladybird larva is uh, my absolute favourite. It is quite a chunky little larva, but I mean, look at that hairy spikiness. It's like a little furry thing that's feeding on plants um, and grazing the leaf surface. And you can commonly see it in grasslands, for example, in meadows. Um, and parks and um, it's not so easily confused with anything else other than the briny ladybird but the briny ladybird larva and, and its larvae are very very restricted in distribution in the UK um, and if you you're, if you're away from white briny and you're finding something that looks like this it's almost undoubtedly the 24 spot um, ladybird 
And I think what's really characteristic is just that that level of side branches coming out from those bristles um, all over its body. It's absolutely exquisite. So then we move on to um, the pine ladybird. Its name is a little bit misleading. It's not just found on pine. It is a species of ladybird that can be found in, in many different places. And um, there are a couple of other species of ladybird um, of which the larvae look quite um, similar. But the main thing to look for on the pine ladybird, I'll get my mouse working, is these little white patches on either side here. And the ladybirds, so these, um, the pine ladybird, um, the heather ladybird, and the kidney spot ladybird all belong to a particular tribe of ladybirds. So a little tiny bit more distantly related than some of the other ladybirds that we've been looking at. And um, they are quite distinctive in terms of their sort of larval form. So they can look a little bit similar, but if you look out for those little patches, um, then you can't go too far wrong. So we thought it'd be nice to have um, another poll at this stage. And so we would like to ask you, which ladybird species is this? Is it a 10 spot? Is it an orange ladybird? Is it a 22 spot ladybird? Or is it a 24 spot ladybird? Okay, hopefully everyone can see that on their screens again. Okay. So the, the answers are coming, the responses are coming in very rapidly, so that's that's fantastic. I think it's a re another, re I mean, they're all exquisite, aren't they, these, these ladybird larvae, but it's really quite striking. It's almost sort of fluorescent, um, this particular ladybird larva. It is, yeah. Okay, I, we'll, leave it, we'll leave it up a minute and give everyone a chance. We've still got a few more responses coming. You still see it. Is my poll part in the way? Should I move? Oh no, because you can't see the poll part. It's only me that can see that. It's always so confusing to know what I'm seeing on my screen at times. Mm -hmm. um, right, I am going to end that there. We've got 146 responses. There we go. And you have all done extremely well. So we put in the 22 spot ladybird to make it quite tricky but you will notice that this has a very pale head uh, yes a very pale head and also the sort of streaks if you like of yellow although I have to say often when you're out in the field noticing those streaks of yellow it does look even more similar in some ways it, it, to the 22 spot ladybird but it's often in a different habitat but that pale head is a very distinctive part to take a look at and um, well done 81 percent of you for getting that right and most definitely the others of you can um, be excuses very very similar um, particularly to the 22 spot um, ladybird larva great i will take away the pole and um, move back to the slides Great. So we've been through quite a number now of the so-called conspicuous ladybird larvae, but we thought we would just show you an example of an inconspicuous ladybird larva. And this is the skin um, species. Talking with someone this week about another species of ladybird, Cryptolemus, that can also look very similar to this one as well. So um, it is um, a tricky thing to do to identify these, but if you spot something that looks like that, it's almost certainly a little tiny inconspicuous skimness. So we just thought we'd mention a few of the pupae. And I think the most useful thing in terms of identifying the pupae, there are, there are aspects to do with the sort of the architecture and the sculpturing on the surface of that pupal case. But it's that shed larval skin that remains at the base quite often. Some of them it doesn't. Some of them they split down the centre and they retain the larval skin to the sides. But in the case here you can see the larval skin has been shed and you can use that as a clue to which species it is. So you can see here those really prominent spikes of the harlequin ladybird and also the yellow markings, yellow orangey markings that have been left behind that make this a harlequin 
pupa and this one the seven spot with the sort of You're breaking up can't hear you or bristly um shed skin and you can just see these little get be really lucky and see uh, adult lay cases and for those of you who are on twitter they emerged ladybirds from their pupil cases and they look quite different at that stage because the color isn't fully developed um, so the color takes up to 24 hours to to develop but then it carries on being laid down and becoming darker um, but if you're lucky enough to see this there it's really beautiful to see a newly emerged ladybird so we just thought we would very briefly talk about survey techniques and um, to, to be really honest when I'm out and about I quite often go without any equipment at all and I'm just directly searching in the vegetation maybe turning under I'm turning over leaves. I do spend probably trees just looking up and I look for they are. So I think just searching directly without any equipment is fantastic. But if you want to go out and do some beating, for instance, this is one of our friends, um, Bob Frost on the left, and he's taken out a white umbrella that he uses um, as a beating tray and just turning it upside down and then gently shaking the vegetation into it and seeing what falls out. And on the other side of the slide is Pete um, out and about with his sweep net and um, just gently sweeping through the grasses here. And that can be a really effective way to look through nettles, for instance, as well, or any kind of um, low vegetation. Um, very, very good ways for searching um, for ladybirds. And as Pete's already mentioned, depending on which habitat you're in will um, result in you seeing different types of ladybirds. So some of the species we've shown you are really specialists within pine habitats. Others you are much more likely to find in many, many different places. And that's one of the problems in a way with the harlequin identification is that it does occur just about everywhere. And one of the species that looks very like it is the Cream Street ladybird. And that is a pine specialist, but you can also see the harlequin there. So very quickly thought I'd just talk through uh, making a record and we have an iRecord form that you can use um, online and you can get to that through our website um, where we've got lots of other information about um, all of the different species and other resources as well. You could also download the iRecord app if you're interested in recording lots and lots of different species then um, the iRecord app is fantastic it works really really well and um, we also have um, developed in partnership with others across Europe we have some amazing collaborators and friends working on ladybirds and we developed this European ladybird app so once we're allowed to be out and about again if you're if you're straying further afield then you might like to use the European ladybird app so it's got the longer species list representing um, some of the species that we don't have in the UK but can be found elsewhere We've also heard the exciting news that the FSC have a sale on these um, ID charts and there is one for larvae and there is one for adults and um, I will just put an extra plug in for those and say they make fantastic birthday cards. Um, so perhaps you should all be logging on and buying a few of those. And then um, shamelessly I'll mention our field guide to the ladybirds of Britain and Ireland um, which we um, wrote and is illustrated by Richard Lewington and um, the illustrations are just absolutely magnificent and includes all of the inconspicuous ladybirds and um, larvae and pupae for all of the conspicuous ladybirds. Um, so you may, may like to take a look at that. I also thought I'd mention that next week, very excitingly, it's National Insect Week. So if you go online and take a look at the National Insect Week website, you'll see there's lots of virtual activities running throughout the whole week. Um, so that might be um, of interest to you. A wonderful opportunity to celebrate entomology. 
So we move to um, the question part of this talk, which I'm really looking forward to. But first of all, I just want to thank all of the people who provided us with the images that we've used um, throughout this presentation. And um, Jill San Martin has a fantastic Flickr site with just some incredible images, and we've used a lot of his images. And um, to thank all of the recorders as well who make the work for Pete and I just a huge pleasure and a huge privilege. It's really fantastic to work with you all in recording um, Lady Birds and increasing our understanding of this amazingly important group of insects. And we have Twitter at UK Ladybirds, and I think that's all I need to say. And thank you to BioLinks again and all the FSC, FSC team for, for welcoming us to do this on what is a rainy day in Oxfordshire. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Helen and Peter. It was great. I was just wondering, Helen, could you go back? I can't hear you, Holly, but maybe everybody else can. Can anyone else hear can me? Can you hear, Pete? I can hear you, Holly, yes. I can hear you, Holly. Okay. Can you hear me now, Helen? I've lost sound, so I'm just going to unplug and plug. We'll just wait for Helen to come back for a second. I know we broke up on the inconspicuous ladybird uh, larvae slide, so I was just going to ask you to go back over. If all else fails, I could just jump in and yeah. say something equivalent. But Helen, are you back with us? Sounds like not. Shall I just... Actually, I uh, I need Helen to move the slides back to the, the, yeah. the one with the skimness shown. These, the, the wonders of modern technology. It was going so well. <laughs> uh, Helen, can you hear us now? Send her a message via chat. I think, I think Helen's dropped out and she's probably going to rejoin the call okay. uh, to see if that fixes the technology. Holly, could you share the presentation perhaps? That's true, actually, yes. I will do that now. Bear with me one second, I'll get that up. Okay. Oh my gosh, now mine been slow. <laughs> Come on. While you're bringing that up, Holly, should we, should we just ask Sophie if we've got any questions from the chat that we can deal with with Peter while you're doing that? Uh, please do, sorry, it's taking yeah. a long time to load up. Uh, that's technology. Sophie, have we got any Yeah, we've, questions? we've got quite a few have come through already. Um, so we've got one from Chloe Griffiths saying, do the larvae look particularly different at different instars? Um, so, one, the main difference is the size, but also the amount of coloured markings on them. So yes, the very early instar larvae tend to be rather plain, so perhaps just plain uh, dark grey or black. And then those yellow and orangey markings tend to be much more prominent in the third and fourth instars. So the very young larvae are pretty tricky to, uh, to identify, actually. Um, you can look at the spines and still uh, and so on a little bit but quite hard, quite hard to, to get to species level the ones you tend to notice tend to be the later ones anyway because they're um, bigger and um, you know more obvious so quite often we can only identify it perhaps to a particular group with the very young larvae or a particular genus uh, i think really? helen Thank helen you. is back can you hear us, Helen? Well, I'll just ask another question for now. Um, sure. The next one was, uh, is from C. Zuni. And it says, he, uh, they have a strip of nettle which is blocking their drive, but they've noticed that they're covered in the ladybird larva. Um, would it be okay to strip them off? Oh, no. <laughs> well, no, it's up to you. But, uh, I mean, nettles are great for, uh, for, for, for lots of the sort of common ladybird species. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's a tricky one. I suppose you could move your larvae to, s to something else with some aphids on it. Um, if you cut the nettles down, I guess they might not survive, but then if you need to cut them down, then you need to cut them down. So uh, They have uh, terrified. They meant how long should they leave it before oh, how they long? clear it? 
Right, sorry. Uh, well, probably, so the larvae take roughly four weeks from start to finish. So if you've noticed them, they're probably towards the later stages anyway, perhaps. Uh, you might need to wait another couple of weeks before they've um, gone. I mean, the pupil stage only lasts about a week. So perhaps just keep an eye on it. And when the pupae have um, sort of hatched out, when you see the, the adults coming out of those, uh, then, then it'll be fine because obviously the adults can fly off and go somewhere else. Well, we are being very ladybird centric there and remember that there are caterpillars that are also will also be using um, the nettles as a resource as well so um, absolutely yeah. so Helen you broke up um, through the skimness and the next slide so there are lots uh, of requests to kind of sorry. recap on those okay, ones. Okay yeah of course I'm so sorry it must have been a broadband issue and I had to come in twice to get it so I'm so sorry so shall I just continue quickly with these slides can you see that one now? I'm sharing it from my screen. I'm not sure. Yes, I can. Yeah. So shall I, will you just take us through the slides and I'll just, um, I'm so sorry about that. No, no, don't just been a broadband connection. Thank you all for your patience. <laughs> so this is the uh, skimness. So I was just mentioning that um, there are this whole group of ladybirds that look very different um, to the conspicuous ladybirds and their larvae look quite different too. And they are very difficult to tell apart at the larval stage. So if you see something like this, that looks a little bit like a scale insect in many ways, um, this is a skimness um, larva. Next slide, please. Is it clear now, the sound? Is it okay? Yeah, I can hear it. Can everyone good. else yeah, see thumbs good, up? Good. Okay, thank you so much. So these are the pupae, and um, there's a harlequin and a seven spot pictured here. And um, the pupae are relatively easy to tell apart for some species. And I think, from my perspective, the, the, the main clue is in that shed larval skin that you can just see attached at the base of the pupa. And for the harlequin, it's very, very spiky, just as you can imagine once it's been all pushed back as the pupa has emerged and with a seven spot it's quite bristly but you can look at those for clues there are other aspects of the sort of architecture I find the coloring varies a lot so that's tricky but you can look at some of the other traits as well next slide please I also talked you through some survey techniques. I'm so sorry that my sound went through that part. I thought it was just towards the end, but I'm so sorry. So on the left, this is um, Bob Frost, and he was one of our very keen ladybird recorders. And he used to go out with an umbrella and um, shaking the vegetation gently into that umbrella to be able to find that some of the ladybirds that would be in, in those um, vegetation structures and then on the other side is Pete who is sweeping through the vegetation here with his sweep net um, and that's very useful for nettles actually just as you were hearing in the question um, that the a sweep net through nettles can be a very effective way to sample insects but also for me I often find when I'm out and about I'm just looking I, I don't take nets and um, all the time with me sometimes I just go and have a look and I will be turning over leaves or I might be standing underneath a tree and if you stand under a tree you can often see the silhouettes of ladybirds so then that might prompt you to turn over some leaves that are within your your reach and actually there's a, just a great deal of pleasure of just wandering around and seeing what you can see without taking any equipment at all. I think I pretty much now have a search image though where I see all the ladybirds but not very much else but that's fine that's good next slide please Helen I think it was fine from here yeah I think uh, it was those three it was just sort of in and out so we didn't quite catch everything so I'll stop. okay well I'm glad it was fine after that and thank you all for your patience and sorry for our Oxfordshire broadband <laughs> um, um, Sophie could you read the next question please and then that'll show me where I'm supposed to be looking on there. Uh, yeah, so the next one was from Lindsay uh, that said, what are the issues with harlequin and ladybirds? I know they're a problem, but I'm not really sure why. Would you like me to give that a go? But just indicate to me if my sound breaks up again. Is it all clear now? I've lost my confidence yeah, in my sound. It's, it's clear at the moment. <laughs> good, good. So um, harlequin ladybirds, just as Pete mentioned, all ladybird larvae are very hungry larvae and they will eat each other both within they will eat their own siblings they will eat their own species and they will eat other species as well 
and not just in terms of other ladybirds they will eat caterpillars and all kinds of things they just they just need to feed up and the harlequin ladybird is particularly voracious particularly hungry and it will eat an awful lot of different species and it's so well chemically defended and so spiky that not so many things will eat it. And so our really big concern is the impact that it could have on other species. But Pete and I and many others have been doing lots and lots of work on this and there's so much more we still need to know because of course many of these insects are doing something really important. They're helping us out with pest control and you know it's really important to think about how is that function changing when we have a dominance of harlequin ladybirds and some of these questions are things we we don't have the answers to so we want to keep studying them and that's why we invite your records as well um, but that's the main concern with the harlequin ladybird the effects it could have on other species yeah and we've got another question following on from that from tina just asking about other ladybird species do any of the adults feed on the larvae of other species and it's straightforward answer that yes, that is indeed the case. And um, two spot ladybirds are one of the, the least sort of chemically well defended. Um, so they tend to get eaten a lot. Um, Whereas some of the others um, are like the harlequin really do taste quite horrible. So, so there can be sort of um, an imbalance in who's eating what and where. But yep, they'll all give it a go. <laughs> Oh, hungry things. Okay, we've got a question for uh, Peter now, which is asking, is there any difference in identifying males and females? Oh gosh, um, I think the short answer to that is no. Even with the adults, the males and females look pretty similar. There are subtle differences between some of the adults and there's often a size difference with the adults, with the females being larger on the whole. But with the larvae, I don't know of any differences at all. I don't know if Helen has anything to add to that. No, absolutely. I don't think we have any pointers with the, the larvae as to which are male and which are female. Um, with the adults, sometimes the males are smaller than the females. Um, but at the larval stage, no, very, very, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, and then Stephen was asking, how much does diet vary in ladybird larvae? Shall I take that one? Yeah, oh, yeah. go for it, Pete. So, uh, the, uh, quite unusually, actually, for, for, in, in, for many insects, ladybirds feed on the, the adults feed on the same things that their larvae fed on. So that's not often not the case. Um, but with, with ladybirds, that's true. So if you're a mildew feeding um, larva, your adult later on will, will feed on that same um, mildew. Um, I've lost my train of thought as to what the actual question was. Was it about the breadth of yeah, diet? Yeah, breadth of diet. Sorry. So um, most of the species are predatory. And so things like green fly and black fly aphids, uh, are, the, are the main things that many of the species feed on and most of the ones we've shown you today that's true of although some of them feed on other uh, insects like uh, they feed on scale insects and white fly and other little bugs like that um, we have three mildew feeding species and two that are herbivores um, so the 24 spot ladybird that Helen showed you and the briny ladybird are the only ones that are properly um, herbivorous. Brilliant, thank you. Um, a question for Helen, you were talking about recording uh, just a bit earlier. Uh, Damien was asking, are there any particular species it would be useful recording wise to look out for? Well, for us, it's really useful to have records of everything that you're seeing. So sometimes people say, should I just keep recording the seven spots when I keep seeing them over and over again in the garden? Well, it's really useful for us to have all of the records of everything um, that you see. There are some species that you might be particularly interested if you've got white bryony around, why not take a look out and see if you can see bryony ladybirds and you might see some feeding damage on the leaf surface appearing as little windows um, in the leaf. And there's some of the little tiny ladybirds as well, and we'll mention um, a few of those when we meet again um, in July, that you could also take a look for. Um, a really lovely one that occurs in ivy, Nephus quadrimaculatus, um, is one you could take a look out. And there's a little skimness, skimness interruptus, that's a nice one to look out for. But from the 
um, conspicuous ladybirds, we just love to have records of everything. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, a question for Pete asking, how do you maximise the chances of detecting five spots on river shingle? And when is the peak time for active adults? Oh, good question. So the five spot lady, but that's one we haven't spoken about today. Uh, that's a very, um, just for, for background for other people, that's a, it's a rare species and it's, it's very localised in parts of Wales and Scotland. It doesn't occur in England at all on these river shingles. Um, so the best time, I mean, adults will be active really probably from March through till about September, October, probably September. Uh, I mean, the best time for adults of most of the species is going to be late spring and perhaps mid to late summer. So there's a little bit of a lull at the moment where lots of them are in their larval stage. But if you go back in July or August, the numbers of adults will probably be higher. So that would be a good time to, to look for them this year. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, a question for Helen. Uh, so it's from Mia. She was saying we've used... Oh, I might not be able to pronounce this correctly. Okay, we've used Cryptolemus montoseri, I think, uh, for an experiment with fire control in a glass house. Is there potential for negative ecological impacts from using non-native ladybirds for biocontrol? That's such an excellent question. And you know, the harlequin ladybird, there's many characteristics of the harlequin ladybird that mean it really wasn't, in hindsight, a good idea as a biological control agent, which is what it was introduced for in mainland Europe because of its breadth of diet and um, because it's so voracious and because it will live in so many different habitats. Many of the tiny ladybirds like Cryptolemus that are used in greenhouses um, for biological control do not present those same kind of problems. And there's some really fantastic success stories of um, these tiny ladybirds being used for biological control. Indeed, on an island far, far, far away from here in St. Helena in the South Atlantic, they introduced a little ladybird that is really saving their cloud forests um, by feeding on a pest that was decimating them. So they have huge use. And um, very, very rarely we get a report of Cryptolemus um, having sort of strayed from the glass house. Um, but they are small scale feeding um, insects and when used in sort of the the ways which which they're advised to be used um, they can be very useful in those glass house um, settings. Brilliant thank you and a question for Peter. Alison asked um, the appearance of adult harlequin ladybirds varies do the larvae also vary? Yeah, another great question. Harlequin la uh, adults really are incredibly variable. But the, the good news is, no, the larvae all look the same. So, uh, the, I mean, they, they vary depending on the, the instar, but apart from that, you can't tell from the larval stage whether it's going to be a, a black harlequin with red spots or an orange harlequin with black spots. They look exactly the same. That's interesting, thank you. Um, question for Helen asking which are the most common species that um, you can find in your garden? Another really good question. So seven spot ladybirds are very common in gardens and as we've already heard occurring on people's nettle patches as well that are around their houses. Um, harlequin ladybirds are incredibly common um, in people's gardens. Um, we are having a few more records coming through of two spot ladybirds at the moment. And this is a species that was really historically widespread, um, but does seem to the strong correlations with the arrival of the harlequin ladybird and um, declines in the distribution of the two spot. The two spot ladybirds um, will favor garden habitats, 10 spot, 14 spot. You can see a lot of 14 spot ladybirds. So actually you can, there's quite a number that you can see in your garden, pine ladybirds as well. Um, Less so would you find something like the orange ladybird, but it depends on the habitats around you. If you've got some really lovely deciduous um, trees growing around, then you may well see um, them as well. So yeah, I think that's a, a fairly good selection. I don't know if Pete wants to add any others that I might have missed in that. No, just to say that we, we chose the species today based mm -hmm. on the ones we thought people would be most likely to see. So yeah. um, those are the perhaps the 12 most commonly seen ones in, in, in an average garden, although yeah, lots of variability. 
Yeah, actually, you would commonly find 22 spots in the garden as well, particularly if you've got some courgettes with mildew on them or something. If, you're, if your garden's anything like mine and not um, very well kept up together, um, then you see even more of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've got a fairly ordinary garden. It's sort of an average size and it's a bit scruffy. Um, but I've had eight or nine species mm. at times in, in the garden. So, you yeah. know, if you're lucky, you can get that sort of number just in a small patch. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another question for you, Peter. We we're talking about harlequins just before this question. Um, Chris was asking, should we kill harlequin ladybirds if we see them, seeing as they're invasive? We've always said no to that um, because really there's not much point. Uh, and what we're worried about as well is people killing the wrong thing sometimes. So. I think there's the, certainly in the early days of the Harlequin arriving, there was a tendency for people to see anything that didn't look like a sort of standard seven spot ladybird and think it was one of the invasive ones. So I suspect a lot of people were squishing the wrong things. So, but even if you are sure, I would say there's not really a lot of point, I'm afraid. So I, I wouldn't do that. Oh, thank you. Um, a question that was from Jean. Uh, she was asking, how much of a problem are parasites to larvae? Uh, so Helen. That's a wonderful question. I love a parasite question. I find parasites absolutely fascinating. And um, so another trouble is I could now go on for hours about the ladybird parasites. Um, that, so ladybirds do get attacked by a few different parasites. There's a wonderful parasitic wasp. There's some parasitic flies that will also attack them. They get some worms, um, different things, um, pathogenic fungi. But actually, even though they have this sort of suite of parasites that attack them, we don't think they make very much difference to the overall populations of ladybirds. So even in an area where you might see a lot of this little wasp, and you would see it as a little fuzzy cocoon underneath the legs of the ladybird and the ladybird twitches on the top of it. Um, we can perhaps post a picture. The ladybird essentially acts as a bodyguard and the little parasite has already been laid as an egg inside the adult ladybird and it's fed on the insides of the ladybird, but very cleverly and perhaps macabrely leaves its leg muscles intact so it can still, um, so the ladybird still twitches. And, um, that little cocoon is very visible as a little orange fuzzy cocoon underneath the ladybirds. But even when you see that in relatively large numbers, it's still only about 10% of the ladybirds that um, succumb to that infection. And well, I have to say, actually, it's such a beautiful wasp. It's kind of really nice that it's part of the, the network um, alongside the ladybirds. Um, yeah, perhaps I should stop there before I no, go no, on for no, a very no. long time about, I, I well. just adore parasites. <laughs> Um, there are a few questions in the chat about adult ladybirds, just so everyone knows. I'm purposely ignoring them because we're going to go over that in the next session. Um, so I'm just trying to pick and choose the ones about larvae for today. Uh, so bear with me for a second. While Holly's doing that, I will just mention that in about an hour's time, we will be closing bookings for the the second ladybird talk because it's very, very close to being fully booked. We might be able to offer a few later spaces um, when we've sorted out cancellations and double bookings, but we won't be able to leave it open over the weekend. So anybody who wants to come back and hear more from Helen and Peter, now is your final, final warning. <laughs> uh, get, get, get it booked before, the, before five o'clock today because otherwise it's going to be very tricky to get on that one. Well, thanks, Kieran. I've caught up on the questions now. Um, there was a question from Andrew asking, does uh, skimness, which looks like a scale, feed on woolly scales? Um, to Peter. Mm, good question. Now, uh, I lose track of exactly which things all of these little skimless species feed on. There's actually a whole range of different skimless species feeding on different tiny little um, bugs. Some of them do feed on woolly scale insects, I think. Is that 
true, Helen? I can't remember which one specifically offhand. Yeah, it is true that some of them will feed on the woolly scale and um, some of them are feeding on the other scale insects. And actually, in terms of sort of breadth of diet, um, the um, hieroglyphic ladybird feeds on leaf beetle larvae, for instance. So, the, you know, there can be a little bit of difference between them. Um, so, but we can, within our field guide and within our atlas, there's a full list of who feeds on what. Um, and perhaps we can circulate that to you so you can sort of see it as a tick list chart. Um, but yes, yeah, some of the little ladybirds will feed on um, the woolly scale insects. Thank you. Um, a question from Sharon. Uh, so this would be for you, Helen. Uh, she was just asking, with all this wet weather at the moment, is that going to have a negative effect on the ladybirds this year? So it depends on how long it goes on for. And um, I mean, insects are just amazing at coping with this wet weather. I mean, there's again been some fantastic photos posted on Twitter of, you know, a butterfly sitting on a leaf with the, the rain just hammering on the leaf and it still manages just to stay there. And, you know, you can see ladybirds will be covered in, in raindrops, and, but they can fly through the rain as well. If the temperature is warm enough, they can keep on flying and it might be a raindrop hits them and it throws them off a little bit, but then they just keep on going. So they're remarkably resilient actually to the to the British weather um, and you know if it means there's going to be a little there's going to be more aphids further down the line because the plants are a better food source for those aphids then this spell of wet weather could be really good um, for them um, but of course if it's a complete washout throughout the whole summer it'll be more to do with the fact that they just won't reach the temperatures and things that they need to be able to get for those who have an extra generation for instance it will affect them um, but it's so many complex interacting factors like the weather and um, food availability that kind of overall affect how well they do. But let's hope, let's hope they have a good year. <laughs> yes, that's amazing how resilient they are. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on time now, so I'm only going to ask a few more questions. Um, we've got one from Charlotte. Um, so this is for you, Peter. Uh, just asking, on the FSE fold-out chart, it mentions the scarce seven spot and, oh, I'm not sure what that says, uh, Myrmesophile, Syphilae. Yeah. Um, can you tell us any more about them, please? Okay, yeah, sure. So it, Myrmesophile, it means it's an ant-loving species. So that's a bit of a technical word. Um, so most ladybirds don't get on well with ants or with some ants. Um, there's a conflict over the aphids with, with some of them. So some, you know, People might know that some some ants farm aphids and some well, many ladybirds are trying to eat those aphids so there's a conflict there but the scarce seven spot ladybird is one that seems to be tolerated by ants and in fact is tends to only be found with wood ants from work that other people did uh, professor mike majurus from cambridge many years ago uh, I think was the one who kind of discovered that the the scare seven spot ladybirds don't rely on the ants so it's not a really close interaction you can rear them in the lab without the ants there but they they live with each other in the field and, and in this country you only find scarce seven spot ladybirds where there are wood ants so it tends to be in sort of heathlands and pine woodlands and that kind of habitat. That's amazing, thank you. Right, one more question. We've got one minute left. Um, one from Jay Maddy uh, for you, Helen. Uh, they were just asking, do newly emerged larvae have to wait a short while for the exoskeletons to harden? Yeah, so when they hatch from um, the egg, actually they are under quite a lot of pressure to get eating as quickly as possible. And um, if you imagine a teeny tiny little larva coming out of one of those tiny eggs, it's about the same size as the aphid prey that many of them will be feeding on. And so actually, the reason they're under pressure to get going quite quickly is because of that cannibalistic tendency they have that um, Pete mentioned early on. Um, the first ones to emerge from that little cluster of eggs um, will begin to eat their siblings. So they will eat their eggshell, but then they'll start to eat their little neighbors who haven't been quite as fast as they have in hatching. So they're very quick to get going and to get eating. And um, similarly, actually, when they emerge um, as an adult, they need to, you know, to harden off their exoskeleton. That exoskeleton does extend to their kind of gut lining, if you like. Um, but they're, they're working really quickly to do that because time is of the essence um, 
when you're a ladybird. Brilliant, thank you. Right then, that's the end for today. So big thank you to uh, Helen and Peter for joining us and taking the time out to uh, do this for us today. I hope you all found it as useful as I did. Um, and thank you all for coming as well. Um, we'll send around those links and things we were popping in the chat earlier uh, to UK Ladybird Survey and all those other things around in a follow-up email. So um, don't worry about trying to copy and paste things from the chat. We'll send that to you afterwards. And yeah, hopefully we'll see you on the next one, which is 9th of July. As Kieran was saying, I would advise booking sooner rather than later because it's going to be full soon. Hopefully we'll see you then. And yeah, goodbye. Um, if you want to unmute yourselves and say goodbye as well, that's fine. We can see you all. Thanks. And book on the Earth Thank you all. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you, Holly. Bye, Lynn. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.